So uh, we now move on to our last topic of this session. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mudit Tyagi who will be talking on ignoring patients' subtle complaints, what can go wrong. All right. Good afternoon and first let me thank Dr. Reema Bansal for having me as a part of this uh, great IC and to all my co-speakers and chairperson and AIC scientific committee. So I'll be talking about what happens when we ignore the subtle complaints of our patients and what can go wrong. Now the thing is that as clinicians often we tend to sometimes kind of overlook what our patients are telling us, try to in a hurried clinic ignore some of their complaints, but please we should remember the fact that the most important person in that room is our patient and sometimes they're extremely perceptive of their complaints and probably what we can learn from a good history is something to which there can be no alternative. So let me show you a few examples where things can go devastatingly wrong if we end up ignoring what our patients are telling us. So this was a 40 year old male patient from Hyderabad who came to us with a complaint of a central scotum on the left eye since just one day. He had shown somewhere elsewhere and he was told that there's a small hemorrhage in the eye, there's nothing to be worried about, it's probably because of hypertension, go and get your BP checked. But there's no history of trauma, no history of any strenuous exertion. No systemic history, though he does give you a history of a gastrointestinal stromal tumor re removal around 10 years back. No other systemic or significant clinical history otherwise. His vision was 20-25 in the right eye, 20-50 in the left eye. This is the right eye which is absolutely normal. If you look at it, there's a small subhyoid hemorrhage over here, or sub ILM hemorrhage over here through which an OCT was done. And he had been initially told that there's nothing to be worried about. This hemorrhage will go away. Let's observe it for around two weeks. But this patient was extremely insistent about the fact that this is something that just happened two days back and he can perceive a very significant scotoma in his work. So when we started looking at him, this is what we found. Apart from the sub ILM hemorrhage, this is what we found. There was a single wide centered hemorrhage, just one single hemorrhage over here. And when we got this patient investigated as to why does he have this in the first place along with one small sleek hemorrhage here. And this is the OCT showing that small hemorrhage, the sub ILM hemorrhage. Our differentials usually for wide centered hemorrhages predominantly range between blood dyscrasias and occasionally endocarditis. So while there was no other thing, he did have a hepatosplenomegaly which you can probably also attribute to the past history of the GIT that he had. But to our surprise, his WBZ counts were significantly elevated. It was 139,000. And when we did a peripheral blood smear, what we found was myeloblast, promyelocyte, metamyelocyte. This was actually a case which was Philadelphia chromosome positive CML. So a single white centered hemorrhage, which could have been ignored, helped us in arriving at a diagnosis of this patient having a CML. And that's where it's important for us to look at what the patient is having and to listen to every single thing that our patient tells us. And therefore it becomes important for us to listen and attribute their clinical features and not just dismiss them altogether. This was another patient. This is a patient who had a past history of toxoplasmosis. Again, came a week earlier with a complaint of slight decrease in vision, was told that the other eye is normal and was sent back. But this patient came back again saying that she's still perceiving the same problem. And now when we look at the right eye, we see this over here. There is an active toxoplasma retinochoroiditis which was initially missed. So the point here is that when our patients tell us that they can feel a slight difference, the vision at this point of time was still 20-25 in the right eye, mind you. But that is because the lesion was away from the fovea over here. There is a small amount of fluid, but this patient perceived a small scotoma, small decrease in vision, and she came to the clinic. And therefore, it becomes important for us to look at the other eye and examine our patients in detail. Another subtle point which can often go overlooked is when a patient comes back with a hypopion. So a hypopion in a known case of leukemia, and if we again miss up, again that can invite trouble because a hypopion in a known case of leukemia can alert us to the possibility of either a relapse or a blast crisis. So patient of leukemia, if they come to you with a hypopion, that can be often a first indicator of the patient either going into a relapse or an impending blast crisis or occasionally also a CNS involvement because we sell through the leptomeningeal arteries to the come over here and into the, through the ethmoid arteries come over here into the anterior chamber. So when you see a atypical hypopion in a patient of leukemia, please be extremely wary. Check them for an impending blast crisis. Get a MRI done because occasion and send them to the treating oncologist because this can also herald the neurological spread. Again, I'd just like to show you some cases where a possible history would have saved us. So this is just an example of the case and a background to what I'm about to show you next. So these are cases which we had published where our patients came to us with a history of an AC inflammation and corridor detachments and hypopion. And what we found was that this was a patient who was using topiramids. So when this patient was seen, they were initially thought of as an angle closure. 
somebody attempted doing a surgical PI over here in this patient, which led to this inflammation cataract, and these patients developed a chronic persisting inflammation later on. What we failed to notice was that this was a patient who was taking topiramid. All that this patient needed was a discontinuation of topiramid and starting the patient on topical steroids and cycloplegic like atropine, and that would have taken care of the entire problem. If you end up missing that, this is what can happen. Now, I know this picture appears ghastly, but what had happened over here was this again was a patient who had presented somewhere with a complaint of sudden angle closure, and therefore they decided to remove the intumescent cataract. In the process, the cataract was removed, but all of this subsequent inflammation occurred, and this was a patient who was taking chlorothalidone. So whenever you see patients with an atypical presentation, it makes sense for us to pause, listen to their complaints, and go back and take a history. More importantly, what are the drugs that the patient is using? So drugs like chlorothalidon, topiramid are all known to cause AC inflammation, angle narrowing, and intense choroidal detachments also. If we can stop those drugs in conjunction and discussion with their treating physician and start them on topical steroids and atropine, that will take care of the entire thing instead of leading to complications like this, where subsequently we had to do a membranectomy, relieve and remove those ciliary body membranes and put oil inside the eye. But all of this could have been avoided if we had again taken a history, paused and listened to our patients. Last example, this was a patient who had a past history of ARN since 2016, was doing well for five years continuously. He lives in Dubai, had a complaint of a slight decrease in vision, went to the treating physician in Dubai, was told there's nothing to be worried about, your eyes are fine. But what had happened is this patient had a history of a COVID infection in 2020, and we had already seen few cases where there was a reactivation of ARN post-COVID. So while this patient did have a vision of 2020, he was able to perceive a slight decrease in his vision, and when he came to us, what we noticed was that there was a peripheral reactivation of ARN in this eye. He was started on Valacyclovir again, and is now doing well. So in a nutshell, what can happen when we ignore our patient's subtle complaints? And the answer is everything. And therefore, we need to be careful of what our patients tell us. And once they tell us something, to subject them to a complete meticulous ophthalmic examination, as well as a good history for these patients because those clues can itself help in changing our entire treatment paradigm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mudit.